All right. Um, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, today is the 15th of December. This is our final meetup for 2021. Um, potentially the final meetup uh, using Zoom and fully remote, uh, but I can't guarantee that. Um, but definitely it's the final one for 2021. Uh, before we start, let me just share my screen. Yeah. So uh, this meetup, uh, we're uh, hosting Wolamai from Olympus DAO, uh, talking about building the, a decentralized re reserve currency. Our sponsor is Etherscan. Uh, just a quick note from the sponsor, if anyone who is based in Malaysia is interested to work in a blockchain company, um, feel free to reach out to the Etherscan folks uh, who are hiring both technical and non-technical positions as well. Uh, some to start things off, some monthly roundup. Um, first thing to highlight is this uh, updated Ethereum roadmap uh, that got shared by Vitalik on Twitter recently. Um, so there's five different kind of verticals uh, that the whole Ethereum ecosystem is trying to uh, work on. Uh, first is the merge, which for those of you who've been following, uh, the ETH2 is now not really uh, called ETH2 anymore. It's a merge between the proof of work and proof of stake. Uh, chains where the proof of work chain proof of work will be dropped and proof of stake will be the consensus mechanism um, uh, to use for Ethereum. Uh, then there is the search, which is uh, mostly around uh, building up scalability with uh, sharding. Uh, then there's uh, the verge, which uh, is focusing on statelessness. The purge, which uh, is about uh, removing past uh, history on the blockchain. And lastly is the splurge, which involves a bunch of different miscellaneous items, uh, including, interestingly, uh, an EV stuff for those of you in our community who've been following. Uh, then another uh, cool announcement just a few days ago uh, is uh, there's a bunch of uh, ETH Global in-person events that's been uh, announced. Uh, DEF CON is, I guess, pseudo-confirmed uh, to be uh, on the, uh, in quarter four of 2022. Uh, for those of you who are curious, uh, definitely going to DEF CON is one of the best experiences you can have as someone in the Ethereum or even wider blockchain ecosystem. There's a lot of things you can learn, a lot of people you can meet, and it's not one of these uh, shilly kind of conferences um, that unfortunately some uh, cryptocurrency ones are. And um, maybe a bit more relevant for people here because Bogota is kind of on the other side of the world. Uh, there's ETH Taipei, which is uh, planned for December 2022. Uh, that's a lot closer and uh, might be interesting for you. Generally, there would be hackathons uh, as well as uh, the conference itself. So if you want to participate, even if you're not a technical person, uh, the ETH Global hackathons are an amazing place to uh, get your foot in, uh, in within the ecosystem. And um, DevCon for sure, they take volunteers, where if you volunteer, then you don't have to uh, pay for the event um, costs. Uh, ETH Global, I'm not sure, but we can find out later. And if you can volunteer, then that would be a very good way, not just to like get a cheap uh, place to, cheap way to get into the uh, conference, but also you can kind of build your uh, personal brand uh, yourself by volunteering at uh, one of these uh, events. Then uh, another main one, especially for Malaysians, um, those of you who still use WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp launched their cryptocurrency payments pilot uh, for now only in the US, uh, but uh, with the plan of rolling it out in other countries. Um, interestingly, they, the DM blockchain itself hasn't really been pushed out. And I think they probably decided that the payments thing is much more viable uh, to push before DM. Uh, Kickstarter, which is a, if the, for those of you who don't know, it's a crowdfunding uh, platform and they've announced that they'll be using the blockchain. Um, and, and open source uh, methods uh, to raise funds. So that's an interesting way of how Web3 is taking over Web2. And um, lastly, from the global uh, news is, uh, for those of you who've been following, there's a lot of uh, sushi swap uh, DAO drama. Uh, I don't know too much of the details. If anyone knows a bit more, you know, and you love to gossip, feel free to share in the chat, but it's also, uh, a very interesting kind of social uh, case study of how DAOs work uh, in the in the wild, and this being one of the biggest DAOs 
there are with a lot of community um, participation, if not support. Um, it's interesting to see how uh, things will pan out uh, to, uh, to the team. And with our guest today being uh, from a DAO, so it might be a good source of questions as well. Then uh, for some local news, uh, so Selangor FC uh, announced a Red Giants non-fungible collections. Uh, interestingly, both on OpenSea uh, and Pentas, which is a local NFT platform uh, on the BSC chain. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Malaysian football, Selangor FC is essentially like uh, Real Madrid uh, in the local space. I think they've won maybe like almost 30 uh, league titles uh, historically. So uh, they're essentially the biggest football team there is in Malaysia historically. Uh, although recently there's uh, JDT uh, that's kind of had a lot of uh, bankroll to, to beat them. Um, then um, for those of you who've opened your Luno app or account uh, on the website, you've probably seen a survey that they've uh, sort of passed around to their users. Uh, so Luno is planning to offer uh, quite a bit more cryptocurrencies next year. Um, I think the survey had nine uh, items with you being able to choose three. Uh, what I've heard is that they'll probably have about three to four that they will suggest to Securities Commission and um, those will be added to the, the coins or tokens that you can trade. Um, and in this way also being able to use your ringgit, your fiat money to be able to buy. And uh, lastly, from the monthly roundup, uh, this is a really interesting story. I think um, I only heard about this like two days ago. Uh, so our former PM, uh, Najib Razak, uh, for those of you who are not in Malaysia as well, uh, you might be familiar with the 1MDB story. Um, so this is uh, that PM and uh, he was officiating an NFT launch. It looks like a gamify um, platform, kind of, I think, um, uh, 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 inspired by uh, XC Infinity. Um, I can share the video. Literally, this, this picture is a screenshot from, from a two and a half hour YouTube video uh, shared by the team. Uh, interestingly, the whole event was in Chinese, um, but they did get Najib to share like some, I guess, words of wisdom to officiate the ceremony. Uh, I can share the, the, this link later and the YouTube uh, video as well uh, inside our probably Telegram group, and you guys can uh, see for yourself uh, how that works out. All right, so uh, that's it for our monthly roundup. Uh, so uh, we can get uh, Wallamai from uh, Olympus DAO to, um, uh, to come up. Uh, as far as I can help him share slides. Yep. Let me share the slides. Yeah, I'm just seeing the comments now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yep, I think we can pass it over to, uh, pass the floor to Wallamai. Welcome. Thank you. Um, interesting to see a different lens on the crypto space from like a different part of the world. Um, so hello, I'm, I'm Wallamai. Um, I work within um, Olympus DAO. Um, and I'd like to start with what that means. What does it mean to work within Olympus DAO? Um, so I should note that um, I'm not an official member of staff with the founding org who created um, Olympus. So everything that I share tonight, you can consider with um, a contributor lens. Um, con contributing to Olympus DAO, there's uh, oscillating between 100 and 200 of us who um, I'd say primarily most of the work that's happening um, within the Olympus ecosystem is contributors. Um, but why do I raise this? Um, I don't want to present myself or anything that I say tonight as the official Olympus stance. Um, so any mistakes that I make are, are mine personally. Um, and a shout out to a community member, um, Asfi, for um, letting me use the slides. Um, and uh, yeah, 3-3. Three, three. Um, so what does it mean to contribute within Olympus DAO? So, a DAO in the sense that we mean it is um, folks who are in line with um, the vision of what Olympus is can kind of show up to the work discord um, and get involved in a, a number of departments. Um, so next slide, please. 
So Olympus DAO, when it was co-initiated by some early OGs such as Zeus, Apollo and others, um, and Jeff, um, had a vision of creating a decentralized reserve currency that's backed by a community-owned treasury. Um, so a few words here, what do we mean um, by decentralized reserve currency? We'll get into that. Um, but a really important thing here is it's backed by a community-owned treasury. So behind the scenes within the DAO, there's um, oscillating between 10 to 20 um, contributors, um, some of them from the uh, core initiators, um, through to um, folks who've just turned up with a deep level of expertise who manage the treasury. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So um, what is a reserve currency? Um, so the, the primary reserve currency that we're all um, used to in the, in the world is the US dollar. Um, but what are its traits? So typically, um, a reserve currency is backed by some set of assets. But with, in the case of the dollar, it used to um, be, uh, when it was on the gold standard, 1971, it was gold. Um, but now it's backed by kind of US military might. Um, the second is that it's um, free floating and not pegged. Um, so what does this mean? Is most currencies, all currencies um, in the globe are pegged to the dollar. Um, but the dollar itself is not pegged to anything, it's, it's free floating. Um, and then the third point, deep liquidity. So wherever you are in the globe, whatever currency you have, um, you're, e you're able to trade that currency for dollars. Um, so it's really deep, deep liquidity. So what would this mean in the DeFi space? Um, what would a DeFi reserve currency require? Next slide, please. So a DeFi reserve currency would need to have corresponding um, traits. So instead of um, assets or military might, we have protocol owned assets. Um, the second would be it's free floating and not pegged. So it's not pegged to the dollar, it's free floating similar to the US dollar and protocol owned liquidity. So we need a depth of liquidity so people can trade in and out um, of own. So as Asfi would say, um, Olympus launched about eight months ago or so. Um, how's it been going? Next slide, please. So since launching in April with about $70,000, we can see that the um, protocol owned assets and that's assets in the um, treasury um, have grown from 70,000 in April up to 790 million. Next slide, please. So protocol owned liquidity. So that's the, um, the depth of when you want to trade in and out of OM um, has grown from nothing up to 580 million. Um, as a data analyst, I should state that all of the, this data that we are um, showing in these slides um, is all stuff that you can um, check the contracts on Etherscan and you can uh, pull this data yourself. Many of these charts have uh, adapted from um, June Analytics, which another community member, shout out Shadow and um, Potted Me and Rakowski and folks over um, in uh, data and marketing and policy and other such for creating these kick-ass um, June Analytics slides. But all of these um, charts that I'm showing you are kind of, it's an open, open financial system. Um, Web3, another way of thinking about it is it's um, an open financial system where you can kind of read the books of any claims made about the system. So each of the different colors here, they each correspond to um, a different type of assets in the liquidity pool. Um, so uh, common ones might be the um, die own pair. Um, another one would be um, own ETH. Um, and there's a few others as well. Okay. Um, next. Okay, so this is protocol owned assets, excluding the native token. So it's worth noting here that within DeFi, most um, projects, uh, uh, when they're disclosing the size of their treasury, they include their native token, um, typically their governance token. Um, in the case of Olympus, um, the 500 million um, is the protocol owned assets um, without including any own. 
Um, so it's kind of unique in that sense that we don't include um, our own token base in the assets that we're um, disclosing as part of the treasury. Um, next slide, please. And then there's this notion of uh, risk-free value. Um, so that is the um, amount of funds in the treasury that are stable coins and the written down uh, value of um, LP tokens. Um, so DAI ARM, uh, for example, it would count the DAI, but not the ARM. Um, and the am amount that's in the treasury is um, 187 million. So I'll be pulling in some of these figures later on this slides to um, explain why they're important. But next slide. Thank you. Okay, so how how is how is it that Olympus in the course of eight months has pretty much gone from um, zero to the figures that we've just run through? Um, one of the primary mechanisms that that's happened or the, the um, thing that um, Olympus launched with was this mechanism for bonding. So how does bonding work? Um, so say you have some ETH or some DAI um, or you have an LP token that represents um, uh, a DAI owned pair in, for example, Sushi. Um, you could approach the smart contract, the Olympus smart contract, or through the website, um, and you could sell um, one of these um, tokens to the treasury in exchange for some ohm. Um, and that ohm will be released to you um, over a set period of time, so five days. And why would you do this? You do this because you can get a discount um, on the um, ohm relative to the market price. Um, this is a pretty novel mechanism because what it allows the smart contract, the protocol and Olympus to achieve is to own its own liquidity, um, which kind of builds that point three of what does a, a reserve asset require? It requires um, deep liquidity. So um, if we pop to the next slide. So once, um, once someone has bonded and they've received their own, they have a number of options. They could either go to the uh, sushi swap or some other um, DEX and they could trade their own back for um, stable coin or a coin of their own um, choosing, or they could stake what's called 3-3. Three, three. Um, and so in the red box here, you can see a pretty big APY, um, maybe not big in the realm of um, the many forks that have happened um, since, but still big comparative to what we might be used to um, seeing in TradFi. Um, and a common question when people initially saw this um, APY is, sure, how can that be sustainable? Um, so let's pop to the next slide. So a common response from OMIs when the question of the sustainability of um, the high APY um, is to reference this um, thing called runway. Um, so runway is the number of days that the rebases could be paid to stakers if no more revenue from bonding were to come in. So at the current moment in time, that um, the number of days that is, is 376 days. Next slide, please. Okay. So the next thing in these slides, which they highlight is um, the, the keen of I would notice that the market cap for Olympus, which is around um, two and a half billion or so hovering around there, depending on the choppiness of the market, is much greater than liquidity. Um, so the exit liquidity is around 290 million. And for um, context, the largest wallet holder within Olympus at the moment is um, holder of 110 10 million. So how, how within this system um, do we not just have um, a, a run on the bank or um, people kind of uh, worrying that if they want to um, get out of the system that they won't be left, in, left holding a hot potato. And here um, the, the fear of that happening is um, weighed up and balanced um, against this 97% um, treasury claim on under distributed um, own. So we'll get into what that means, but the, the basic mechanic here is trying to figure out on, in psychological terms, balancing the fear of one thing versus the greed um, for this other desirable outcome. So if we pop to the next slide. 
So what does undistributed treasury claim mean? So if you remember from a few slides back, three or four, we had this notion of uh, risk-free value. So there's 187 million um, risk-free value. So to recap, risk-free value is all of the um, stable coins and written down value of LPs in the Olympus treasury um, that was acquired through the process of bonding. And I should mention with risk-free, um, this assumes that um, the um, stable coins themselves don't lose their um, peg and also that the smart contracts aren't hacked in some way and this type of thing. So should mention um, that risk-free doesn't mean entirely risk-free of dependencies um, from either outside attack or um, from the uh, stable coins uh, getting unpegged. Um, and then total supply. So this is the total supply of ohm on the market and then total um, mintable ohm is 180.5 million. So this is um, uh, the amount when someone bonds um, into the system, um, uh, there are three, um, three uh, ohm uh, minted, one for the bonder, um, assuming it's um, one being purchased. One is produced for the um, uh, DAO for operational costs, and one is produced for the stakers. Um, and uh, the ones that are um, destined for the stakers are um, landing in a, a distributor contract. Um, and so um, that is the total number of ohm, which is due to be um, distributed to the holders of um, the stakers of ohm. So essentially what this is saying is that 97% um, of the um, ohm which are due to be distributed to stakers, um, 97 of them, 97% are in that distributor contract. And so what that means then is um, if everyone were to flee the, um, the, the system they were to sell, even if someone were to have uh, the last person holding even 0 0.01 um, uh, of an ohm, would have a claim to all of those 97% um, of uh, un, uh, unclaimed ohm through the process of rebasing. So if we pop to the next, next slide, we can see if there is a bank run, 97% of the risk-free value of 187 million um, is 183 million. So in the case of the largest holder um, who has about 100 and um, 10 million, roughly speaking, even that person, if they were to hold through an entire bank run, they were the last person left holding, they'd still be making a profit of about, what is that, uh, 73 million. Um, so there's a strong incentive um, for some people to stick around, um, even if there is a um, panic. I should mention some of the figures that I just ran through. If I've got imprecisions, those are my mistakes, not the slides mistakes. Um, I can point at the end of this talk to um, the OG uh, Asfi delivering these slides in his, his own words. Um, so it might be worth pointing out to them, but broadly speaking, the broad brushstrokes, um, these are the underlying dynamics for um, the mechanics at play. So next slide, please. So does um, growth happen in Olympus only when new people come into the system? Um, no, not only. However, um, uh, there are other sources of revenue. So for example, when traders are trading or people are, um, uh, uh, that's the next slide, sorry. In this slide, so total, uh, the seven day moving average of um, revenue is about 5.6 um, million a day. Um, so it's uh, Olympus as a system is been so far been pretty profitable. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of uh, the incentivizing um, people to keep bonding into the system, there's this mechanic called um, the 
uh, well, it's, it's, it's this um, calculation. Um, so what we can see in this oscillating um, wave is um, an amplitude which is affected by the mathematical equation above. So um, BCV here is bond control variable. Um, and without getting too deep into the mechanics of it, the, the story here is that um, if someone hasn't bonded in a while, um, the discount that they'll get will increase until there's someone in the market who says, do you know what, that's a really good deal. Um, and then they purchase it. And then the, that um, triggers the, um, the calculation, which figures out the, the discount to reduce. And it keeps happening in this way where within, um, within the bounds set by the policy team and the treasury team, um, you'll get this range, this amplitude within which um, the bonds will either discount or they'll go into costing more than you can get um, at the market. Um, in this way, kind of uh, leaning into the fact that um, out on the market, there'll be some market clearing price within which um, OM as an asset will be attractive to buy. Um, so this is a mostly automated process, but does also have levers um, that the community members um, involved in policy and um, a bit treasury sometimes and a few other um, folks are kind of involved in controlling those levers. Next slide, please. Okay, so all of this is kind of um, jumped straight into the kind of maths, figures, graphs, um, primarily because I've borrowed ASFI's, um, um, ASFI's slides and ASFI's a very precise individual with like a deep understanding of um, the various data sets and uh, mechanics at play within Olympus. Um, and these slides were to be presented um, at a conference where perhaps there were folks coming a bit more from the TradFi context. Within the DeFi space, um, Olympus, you could say, is one of its primary exports, you could say, is this, this meme of 3.3, three. Um, the comma something, uh, the bracket com uh, something, comma something, bracket. Um, notation is now kind of widely propagated throughout um, a lot of DeFi and um, a lot of crypto Twitter and even beyond, we're seeing kind of um, popular figures out there in uh, meat space and popular culture, kind of having references back to um, back to this meme uh, of 3.3, which is a hint back to um, the game theoretic. Um, yeah, someone mentions Constitution Dow as like maybe breaking through to um, breaking out of the, the crypto space into the, the wider popular culture. Um, but really, 3.3 uh, three, three at its core is the game theoretic notation for cooperate, co cooperate, cooperate, um, in the sense of um, uh, when two people involved in Olympus, the, um, the behavior which leads to the best outcome for each of them and the protocol is actually if both of them stake. Um, and so uh, memes have been incredibly important um, within the building of um, a culture around Olympus for communicating at times really complex material. So the stuff that I just ran through um, is complex and a growing number of us um, have managed to kind of learn the essence of what's happening through uh, pictures of frogs, pictures of mushrooms, cartoons, um, and this type of thing, which reduce down complex um, uh, ideas into enough understandable stuff that um, you can start to build something of a shared mental model um, that's kind of like uh, affecting a collective um, feeling. So the pictures here um, on the left is um, there was a Olympus improvement proposal in OIP 18 to reduce the um, APY um, at a certain point, which wasn't a popular um, proposal at first. We see boo, get better material. Um, and then uh, what ended up happening is, you know, you have someone uh, like um, Shadow, a community member from um, Treasury or Policy going up and giving a really, um, excellent um, uh, write-up within the forums that then goes through to a snapshot vote describing the 
um, reasons why actually it makes sense to reduce APY. Um, and here down in the right-hand card, we can see like talking points might be actually when you reduce the APY, you increase the runway, um, you uh, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then on the right, um, ASFI is also involved with um, uh, Klimadao, which was uh, one of the first um, alternate uses of some of the um, Olympus Dow mechanics um, to essentially uh, buy in diamond hand um, uh, base carbon tons. Um, and this uh, meme is essentially uh, making a reference to um, the fact that uh, climate change is a thing, generally speaking, um, is failing to uh, achieve coordinated action. Um, but then when someone shouts about uh, 30k APY, a whole bunch of people um, come and arrive. So next slide, please. So back to the question of um, uh, income, income. So uh, alternate ways that um, Olympus is making money other than um, the bonding mechanisms um, so on the left, we have uh, fees to date from uh, the liquidity pool. So anytime anyone's buying and selling um, OM, the uh, protocol itself is um, making profit. So to date, that's been um, 24 million. And that comes from the fact that Olympus owns 97% of its um, own liquidity. Um, and we're currently expanding out um, across uh, multiple layers, multiple chains um, as we speak. Um, so th those pool fees are going to be um, expanding, not just um, on ETH layer one, but elsewhere as well. Um, the next source of revenue is Olympus Pro. So actually, to be honest, this is how I arrived to, um, to Olympus is I heard Zeus um, talking on a podcast. So Zeus, for those of you who don't know, is, um, was initially, a I think, a South Park character um, who... Um, co-instigated, initiated um, Olympus and uh, was speaking um, on a podcast and mentioned the fact that after the, after the release of um, version one, after they kind of got it up off the ground, said he took a, a bit of a break during which time community members had um, uh, come up with a plan to um, uh, turn the bonding mechanism into a um, kind of a bit of a platform that could be offered to um, other protocols. I think there was um, some friends over at um, uh, Alchemist Scoopy Truples was like, this would be really cool um, if we could use something like this. And uh, since launching in October, um, it's generated about 500K um, in profits. And I think there's something, uh, more than 30 um, partners now using that platform. And the latest announcement is that um, Olympus Pro is um, going permissionless, which will kind of uh, expand the, the reach of this pattern to other protocols. Um, and there are other sources of revenue coming down the pipeline. So we've um, just launched an incubator program, which um, you can kind of think about it kind of like a VC that um, won't end up dumping tokens. So it's, it's going to be a pretty rigorous um, process, but we'll be working with um, early stage partners um, kind of closely aligned to the values, culture, um, and vision of Olympus and uh, creating a mutually beneficial um, flywheel in of incentives. Um, so long story short, um, there's a growing number of products coming through the um, Olympus pipeline that generate profits and revenue that don't depend on new users coming into the system. That being said, with the vision of it being um, a uh, the, the reserve currency of DeFi and beyond, um, it's inevitable that um, there will be new users should we be successful. So all of these different dynamics and mechanisms I've mentioned will um, keep adding to that flywheel. Next, please. So yes, this slide is just talking about strength of community. So mentioning the fact that um, much of the innovation and the products that are being produced within the DAO um, are produced by contributors. Um, so you can think of that in the sense that we don't work 
for the DAO. We don't work for a company. We can contribute with the DAO, with each other. Um, and um, to loop back to the sushi drama, I don't know the specifics um, of it, but um, I can say that from what I've seen within Olympus, maybe one of the differentiating factors between Olympus and other DAOs is that um, the, uh, the opacity between different sections of the DAO um, is not super high. So we've got about 180, um, between 100 and 200 contributors um, and the capacity for someone to take an interest in a section of the DAO and then to become integrated into it and become a productive um, contributor in that zone. You know, we're still figuring it out, but it's, it's not an impossible task. It's, um, it's possible for people um, who are willing to kind of jump into um, that way of doing things. So what this means is increasingly you have a really large number of people contributing towards a common end, building up a shared mental model, as us we put it, or um, other folks um, towards a common a common goal, a common end. Um, and from that shared understanding um, and a um, having a common goal. Um, a great number of products are being produced at very rapid speed. So the bond marketplace was conceived um, and then within six to eight weeks, it was ideated, built out, partners made pr product design, everything stuff and launched um, all without the direct input or initiation of the initial founders. So they had input and of course they were involved in the process. It didn't come from a small group of people. Um, so that's something that um, a number of other DAOs I kind of see or people who call themselves DAOs or this type of thing. Um, that's one of the key differentiators is um, that I've noticed as someone who's been in and around these types of spaces for a long time um, is that uh, Olympus is one of the most decentralized in terms of community decision-making and power um, that I've come across. Um, and that shows up in meme space, the products that are being built um, and some of the catchiness. Okay, next slide. So here's a, um, I can't speak to Klima uh, so much because it's, um, it's not in my wheelhouse, but um, this is um, a reference to the fact that the underlying um, uh, patterns and dynamics um, innovated by Olympus when applied to a different domain, such as the sequestering or the capture of um, base carbon um, tons, um, has been massively impacted. So I think Asfi mentioned in this slide something to the effect of um, since launching in October, um, Klima has managed to capture, I think, like two and a half percent of um, the USA's monthly carbon emissions um, in that short amount of time. Um, so I think this is a reference to the underlying dynamics that um, Olympus has brought to market applied in a different um, domain um, is uh, wildly successful along a different axes. So next slide, please. Um, oh, and this is kind of a reference to what is the total addressable market of um, something which is attempting to be a reserve currency. So when you're getting into the realm of um, uh, reserve currency, the, the total market size, the total addressable market and the market size is in the trillions, it's, it's really big. Um, if we pop to the next slide. Um, and the margins, um, the margins are uh, incredibly big. So generally speaking, when you print money, um, the cost of production. So this should reference that um, the uh, conception within the smart contract, it determines that the, um, the value of an ohm is actually one die. So everything um, on top of uh, one die, um, the difference between that one die and the market price with the discount is all profit um, in that sense. So it's an incredibly profitable 
um, enterprise with a very large addressable market. Next slide, please. Um, and so why, why has ARM caught the attention of so many of us to the point that we, um, many of us have shifted to working to the DAO full time. Um, folks like Asfi are not only just um, investing money, but they're also, um, you know, investing their reputation and their careers, they're binding it to this thing. Um, is that under, underneath the charts and the stuff that we've just shown, um, is that um, what's at stake here is that um, a system such as this is giving um, uh, anyone who has access to the internet a chance to get involved with a decentralized reserve currency that's um, independent of nation state politics, that is um, community directed, that you can have an effect in, that you can um, get involved in which is a pretty profound thing that's new, um, that hasn't happened before. So um, that's what's really got uh, a lot of us super enthused about contributing to Olympus and hopeful for where it can, um, hopeful for where it can go. And then I think the last slide is um, sources. So um, feel free to, um, share the link to these slides so that people can click those links. All of those dashboards are pulling data from the Ethereum blockchain They're built by community members. Um, and yeah, just a, a, a reminder that I'm here in my um, official love of Olympus, but unofficial um, um, capacity. So if I've made mistakes, I apologize, but I hope broadly speaking, um, it paints a picture of um, some of what Olympus has set out to do in the past eight months and kind of uh, how it's been going. All right. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Walamai. Um, so if you guys have any questions uh, for Walamai, either from the presentation itself or uh, just in general that you have about uh, Olympus, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. I see Fauzi has already put one question there. Um, and for the fireside itself, a uh, fireside chat itself, um, we'll get Asfa to uh, moderate the questions. Um, so Asfa can pick the questions uh, that you guys are asking, and he will ask it uh, to all of mine. Uh, so Asfa, yep. take it away. Thank you, Harif. Um, so yeah, thank you all of mine for giving us a taste of what Olympus is building. Um, so I guess before we get into the meat of things, right? Um, uh, Maybe you can share with us a little bit more about, about yourself, like how did you get involved in the space, what's your background, and how did you found yourself uh, where you are right now contributing in a decentralized DAO, so that maybe some of us who are still looking for ways to become involved or maybe think that it is too late for them to join, maybe you can share with us a little bit more about yourself, like how do you start it, what got you into crypto, and yeah, and how you got here. And in the meantime, anyone in the um, call, if you have any questions, do type it out in the chat. So I was just last week um, on the Agora podcast where I shared a bit more of my long, um, long format of how I ended up um, contributing to um, and getting involved in crypto. So I'll give a shorter version now if, if it sparks a bit of interest and I can um, share a link out to that, that podcast. Um, the Agora podcast is one of the community projects um, in Olympus, it's kind of got uh, an increasing kind of media team who does TV podcasts and newsletters and that type of thing. Um, so shout out to them. Um, I've been peripheral and loosely involved in crypto since about 2012 through kind of accident. Um, at that time, I was deeply um, embedded in um, uh kind of grassroots co-ops um, in the UK. Um, and so I was at a workers' co-op um, working in, broadly speaking, I think you could call it an analog version of a DAO. So it was a co-op that was itself a member of a broader federated network of co-ops. Um, and at the time, I was looking to kind of shift a bit my focus of work. Um, so I started doing stuff a bit more with um, computers. And I happened to know a few kind of hacker types um, uh, who 
taught me some stuff and they were playing around with this system called Bitcoin. Um, so one of the first things that I was playing around with was um, the Bitcoin software, just as it happened to be the thing that these people were um, interested in the time. So they were just like, this is a configuration file. This is a flag. This is a blah. Um, and because of that, I kind of got a, 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 a windfall of cash that I didn't work for. It wasn't skilled, skills based. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just lucky in the right place at the right time. Um, and uh, so because of that, I think I had a very early insight into the fact that something really new and strange was happening. Um, and so I, long story short, ended up using some of the um, cash from that Bitcoin to do a coding course um, back in 2014. And I've kind of been working in and around crypto since around 2014. Um, so because of that history in working in kind of a decentralized fashion in workplaces where you didn't have a boss, where everyone was responsible for note taking, for divvying up tasks, for identifying um, kind of work processes and um, client workflow and all of this type of thing. Plus my um, exposure to this weird new internet money stuff. Um, that recently when uh, there's been this more um, movement towards potentially working in DAOs, um, it suited my background in that sense that um, they're really places that place a high value on not self-starters, but people who um, are able to work with other people, identify needs. If you're a good note taker, it really helps. Um, if you're a good coordinator, it kind of helps. Um, and then if you um, have a particular skill set, there's often space within DAOs. I'm not just Olympus, I'm hearing this from other folks who work in other DAOs. Um, uh, depending on the skill sets and interests that you bring, there's generally some type of a, a gap for you. Um, it's, just, it's just a case of finding, finding it. Um, and my piece of advice for what to do to find it is um, oftentimes it's just about showing up and making it really easy for people to know kind of what you're about, what you want to do, um, and that type of thing. So um, the way I got pulled into Olympus is I, I just was, I started this, um, a non-account in September. At first I thought Olympus was too good to be true, didn't want to do it on main, didn't want to look foolish, set up this, um, this mushroom in a shark suit and was a bit of a loud mouth on Twitter, just being like, what's this? How does that work? And eventually when I started sharing some of what I thought was happening, a few people from within the DAO said, hey, you should look at this grants thing, or you should look at that if, the, if these are your interests. And um, that's kind of how I got into it. So yeah, my advice to you would be talk to people um, and make it known what you're about, what you like doing, um, and don't be shy, it kind of, it feels like a, a, a moment in time where it really doesn't matter where in the world you live, you get a, like, you don't have to put your video on, you have voice calls, um, and you'll be able to contribute somewhere to some DAO. We're just in this strange golden age moment where the nature of work is also changing as well as the technology being innovative, it's the patterns and ways of working. Um, are kind of open in the same way that the open financial system is kind of being built around us in these technologies. I know that was a long answer, but I'm really kind of hoping more of us from around the globe who aren't necessarily from Europe or the States um, also get involved because, um, yeah, it's open for all of us. Yep. Mm, thank you, Elmai. I do see there are a lot of questions um, on the chat here, but before we go there, I do have some of the questions that um, I want to ask you. Um, one of the, the main thesis for OM is that um, you want it to be a decentralized uh, reserve currency. And um, I think the common frame of mind when imagining a, a reserve currency is it is uh, of a stable coin, not something that is floating. So um, maybe you can share, share share a little bit like how can a reserve currency uh, become a reserve currency if the value is not back to a dollar? Maybe you can share a little bit about uh, your thoughts on that. So 
Um, the reserve currency that we have, globally speaking, is currently the dollar. So uh, maybe for il illustrative purposes, we can kind of give a broad brushstroke um, like uh, story of how it came to be the reserve currency. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not a historian. This is like broad brushstroke. So any imprecisions are just uh, me making mistakes. But I think the, st the wider story itself is still more or less correct. So after um, uh, the world wars, um, Europe, which had been a colonial power um, and had been kind of a dominant force at that point, um, was much weaker. Um, and the US due to kind of industrial powers and um, not being as uh, close to the histories of maybe overreach from Europe and its kind of colonial exploits um, and all of the, um, the kind of uh, costs of war at that time, um, the, the US kind of um, set up this um, agreement where uh, in exchange for kind of helping Europe rebuild in the post-war effort, efforts, it said, okay, um, the US dollar will need to be the, the primary unit of account. And at that time, the different states involved in that agreement, it, it looked okay because the US dollar at that point was on the gold standard. Um, it was kind of a fractional reserve. So what that means is for every dollar that was printed as part of that monetary policy, at least so, there had to be some um, gold in the bank um, or equivalent um, hard assets um, backing it. Um, so moving forward from that point, at, uh, in around 1971, um, I think it was Nixon um, detached from the gold standard. So what that means is they, they moved from having to be backed by hard assets at all. And that was also coupled with um, uh, deals done with um, the Middle East around oil, where essentially, rather than it being backed by gold, um, this other um, uh, highly sought after um, mineral resource oil uh, would be priced in the dollar. Um, and as such, that would maintain the, the dollar's dominance as the de facto um, reserve currency of the planet against which all other um, currencies are denominated. But I'll highlight here that the US dollar is unpegged. Um, it's the reserve currency, but it's, um, it's unpegged. So in this sense, um, a, Olympus Dow, you can kind of think about it like the 1971 US dollar reserve in the sense that each um, ohm that is minted has to be backed by a crypto version of a hard asset. Um, so right now, I think the other part of that question, um, there's maybe a part of this question which is to do with um, stability. So isn't another property of reserve currency that um, there's at least some pricing stability? Um, and I guess that, again, kind of depends. So some people would say these days with the dollar, given um, inflation and money printing, not just by the states, but by countries all over the place, um, that's not so much, that stability is maybe um, not entirely accurate. Um, but ignoring, igno ignoring inflation and money printing and all of that, um, the vision within Olympus is that um, to get to the point where it does achieve stability, um, where there is so much supply and so much value in the treasury, um, it needs to go through this expansion phase. And during expansion phases, we see a much wider set of volatility where you're exposed to um, uh, kind of uh, big wicks up, big wicks down um, in the process of essentially um, getting to a point where you have um, trillions of ohm um, or a trillion ohm in the market, but it's backed by um, a corresponding um, amount of uh, hard assets in the treasury. Um, and so the vision or the idea is that um, the kind of the market value of the treasury, that is the value of all of the assets um, inside the Olympus treasury, not including the ohm, because we don't count our own tokens, starts to meet the market price broadly speaking. Now, whether that's in who knows what number of years, but that's kind of the trajectory um, and kind of the vision. Um, so I hope if I, if I have misunderstood the question or I've answered it in a way that kind of didn't answer, do let me know. But 
Um, nope, nope. I think you uh, you uh, definitely answered the question and thank you for the short history lesson there. Um, I do want to bring up another thing that um, Olympus got me thinking about, which is protocol own liquidity. And um, can you share a little bit about what is the difference between protocol own liquidity and the normal total value lock or TVL that we sometimes see when uh, projects are uh, showcased? Um, are there any differences and why this or why these differences and how, and how can it benefit um, a project if if they own uh, their own uh, liquidity? I'm gonna uh, there's there's some common answers to this. It just I'm gonna try a new one tonight because you know yellow. So um, let's say you open up a new bar. Um, what's what's a, a cool bar district where you where you're from? Um, you can say Uncle Don. Uncle Don, yeah. right? So Uncle Don's is like the the destination. Um, the owners of the land, like the property owners or whatever of that bar strip or in and around that zone, they know it's they, it's, 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 it's a location, the super hot location. Um, and you as a new um, bar owner, you want to be in in the kind of the hot zone, but you don't you don't have the um, uh, all of the capital to buy buy a property right there, so you rent it. Um, and so you already kind of have this expenditure where you're kind of paying a lot of money to be in this um, this desirable location. So you you're trying to find a way to kind of kickstart kickstart the bar. So you want to get I don't know some influencers um, to the bar. To, so that you can do some of the social media business where you're just like, this bar is popping, check out all these like local people who are gonna like hopefully um, attract a, a bunch more people um, with funds into it. So you agree to pay those people some amount of incentive to kind of be there. So all of the costs so far, they're kind of, um, they're sunk costs. They're not gonna come back to you um, when you're renting at high rates, it's not going towards your mortgage or your own um, like equity increase when you're paying those influencers incentives to kind of come in in the hopes that it attracts um, it attracts kind of more um, punters into the bar, more people to kind kind of come and drink. So in the old school way of doing things, the kind of um, the pull to you would take a snapshot of that moment where you have all of the um, influences in in there, and we call that TVL like total value locked. Now, just because you've taken a snapshot of the value of everyone in your bar at that moment, it doesn't necessarily you as the protocol owner for a uh, Don bar, um, you don't necessarily own the liquidity that's represented um, in that bar at that moment. Um, it's actually kind of um, when those people leave, in this case, for example, liquidity providers for a new protocol, people who have the funds, um, unless incentives are aligned at some point when some other new bar owner is going to be offering a different set of incentives, they'll kind of walk off and go to the next place where they're getting free drinks and um, extra incentives and like bonuses and that type of thing. And if you take a snapshot, then the TVL is kind of gone. Um, so as an analogy, um, this is kind of a lot of uh, in the DeFi summit, a lot of the, um, if you follow the graphs, you'll kind of see essentially there's this growth where it kind of rockets up, um, where the protocol is just distributing its um, incentives out, but then it kind of completely crashes as soon as um, a better offer around the corner on a different bar strip comes along. So the difference between that and protocol owned liquidity is kind of the difference between owning that property um, and renting it in the sense that when someone who's um, coming and interacting with Olympus for the first time or um, other projects which now are using those pole dynamics, bonding dynamics, um, the protocol itself is now owning that liquidity um, versus renting it and people being able to walk off and leaving. So they're quite on the surface of it, big numbers. Um, TVL lock blah, and protocol and liquidity. On the surface of it, they look quite similar, but underneath the power dynamics, the implications, the sustainability um, is quite profound. And um, put another way, um, if you have a supermarket 
and the stocks, the shelves are empty. Um, and the producers of that food are, are no longer, you know, they decide they no longer want to um, stock your shelves for free. You've essentially just got an empty shop with no products in it. It's kind of going to be a ghost town. Um, and increasingly, I think protocols in DeFi, the the lifeblood, the the air um, by which protocols live and die is liquidity. Um, and if you don't have a system which incentivizes or captures value in a sustainable way, um, these projects, you know, and many of them have kind of come and gone, um, won't sustain over time. Um, so we've got maybe eight or nine months of data for Olympus now, and we've had periods where you've had um, the price go up to some amount and you've got 80% pullbacks. Um, and you know, if you're watching the markets, it's kind of hectic and um, maybe doesn't feel good. But looked at through another, another lens, the liquidity is deep enough to, um, to allow for that amount of trading. In, in a sense, it's kind of bullish that it's uh, in the short lifespan of um, this protocol, in the eight months, nine months, it's managed to achieve um, one of the traits um, of what a reserve currency should be able to do. And that is if someone wants to buy in and sell out of um, this thing, they should be able to, which um, so far it's achieving. Thank you very much. I think um, whenever you're in Malaysia, we will bring you to this Uncle Don and then we can pitch the owners about uh, Olympus. Um, so I want to take one question right. from the floor, uh, but I will uh, reframe it a little bit. Um, so uh, 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 recently, Olympus, uh, you guys introduced um, Geom, and you've also deployed on other chains. And maybe j just a subjective question, right? How will that dynamic change? Like, like what does the, uh, the DAO decide to introduce Geom and and uh, how will it affect the dynamics of the DAO when you start introducing other chains? Will everything, uh, will things be uh, different or will things be the same or what's your thought on that? Um, so part of the 3-3 three, three, um, philosophy, cooperate, cooperate, um, I think needs to be um, instructive here. So, uh, Olympus has a grand vision of um, being the um, global reserve currency. Um, however, from what I've seen from the very offset, um, there's a highly co collaborative culture. And so um, I think there needs to be kind of an acceptance that um, Olympus has built up expertise um, and brilliance around many of the new innovations and mechanics um, within Olympus. That being said, there isn't a vision for kind of Olympus becoming experts at absolutely every chain or every domain. And so I think what you'll see more of is um, one of the aspects which um, has made uh, Olympus one of the destination DAOs to come and work for is this um, move towards cooperation. And so with the launch of um, GOM and the Proteus program, which is a hundred million um, dollar incentive program, which is uh, 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 for um, incentivizing liquidity on other chains, um, is that we're gonna see more partnerships between Olympus and um, teams which have domain expertise um, uh, in their zone that they've built up kind of um, uh, kind of products um, and um, skills over the last, I don't know, five, six years. And so you'll see essentially um, partnerships between Olympus and partner org organizations who are helping build out the infrastructure um, in the um, ecosystems that they have expertise in. Um, and you'll be basically seeing um, increasing level of um, uh, ways in which different organizations can create mutually beneficial um, aligned incentives where um, it both meets 
the aims of Olympus and the aims of this other organization and the mutual aims of each protocol and um, the vision of um, Olympus just be, wherever there's a need for liquidity, Olympus is gonna go, it's gonna move like water. Um, and in that sense, anyone involved in the Olympus ecosystem is increasingly going to be able to move throughout crypto, cross chain, cross bridge, cross layer, um, increasingly in, in ways that are frictionless. Um, and so how will that change how we do stuff in the DAO? Um, I just see that um, we're going to keep, keep getting better at cooperating, if I'm totally honest, um, which is just going to be more of the same, um, better processes, iterating on them. Um, one of the comments that many of the Olympus Pro partners give back to us is um, uh, that we're very easy to work with and that the process of working with us is really clearly defined and that makes the entire experience quite enjoyable and stress-free. Um, and I think you'll see that type of feedback um, across all different partnership types. Um, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Olmai. I think it's also the first time that you're having um, a, a DAO contributor uh, in our meetup. So um, I, I would like for, for the next questions to be more DAO-related uh, DAO, uh, DAO because I think there are enough documentation, enough uh, content from the community on Olympus if anyone uh, would want to ask about APY and, um, and, and uh, other monetary policies. And um, so, uh, Wolemai, I believe you are one of the um, proposal writer for um, the OGP, right? Or the Olympus grant program? Yes, that's correct. So like, um, I'm curious, like, um, what does it take to write a, pro a proposal? Um, is it the start of a process for um, executing something in the DAO or is it towards the end? How do you like lobby your, your decisions? And maybe you can talk us through about like what went through your mind? What was the process for you to write out that proposal and convince the community to to um, approve this, uh, this grant program? So I think I mentioned um, my journey into Olympus, if I can start it somewhere, was um, a, a, a being a bit of a loud mouth. Um, I talked about my background in cooperatives, how I felt that um, the, the protocol owned liquidity and Olympus, if you looked at it a certain way, it kind of looks a bit like what um, uh, Nobel uh, Prize economist um, Eleanor Ostrom calls a common pool resource. Um, so that some uh, resource commonly owned by um, a wide number of defined group of people um, towards uh, which meets um, some of those groups of people's needs, but that those that group of people don't all necessarily need to belong to the same organization. So having come from a decade in cooperatives, I was looking at this thing through that lens. Um, and I was like, well, what would it take to build a, a universal basic income around a common pool resource if it looked a bit like Olympus? And so I was just kind of um, chatting shit on Twitter, posting memes and this type of thing. Um, and uh, I think um, a few contributors kind of noticed some of those threads and they said, hey, can you come and look at um, this new product? So we've just released using um, uh, Indigo, this character called Indigo has built out um, um, uh, this uh, new DeFi primitive, which allows you to redirect your yield called Taiki. And on top of that, um, I think this, is this alpha? I think it's not been launched yet, but I think it's been leaked elsewhere. So I don't think I'm gonna get told off for this. There's a product called Give, which is going to allow OMIs to redirect their yield um, in a permissionless way. So you'll be able to redirect it to any ETH address. Although there'll also be some um, kind of a curated list of um, orgs that you can kind of redirect a yield to. And uh, once I kind of, went into the DAO and a bit introduced myself and I was chatting. I think I mentioned the fact that um, I was chatting with uh, someone from Gitcoin, this uh, Scott, one of the, um, the uh, core initial founders, initiators of Gitcoin. And I, I, I was like, why don't, why doesn't Olympus have a grants program? And then um, 
contributor on Banksy, shout out on Banksy, was like, we would like to have one, but everyone's busy at the moment. If you want to help make it happen, then you can, you can kind of go for it. Um, and so that's how that started. And um, what it looked like was maybe four or five people in a DM. I started a document and I looked at the um, Ethereum Foundation grants program and the Uniswap grants program. And then I kind of smashed those two things together. And then I showed it to um, a couple of contributors and I was like, what, what do you think of this? Um, and then about, I don't know, a week of that, like backwards and forwards, um, it got to a point where someone said, hey, this looks more or less ready. You just need to find some people for, for the committee. And I was like, well, who do you think? I don't really know anyone. Um, so then some names were suggested. We had a chat. And then um, after that point, then we um, put up the OIP. And then it's kind of like at that point. So there is a, you're right to point this out because within the DAO, it's, um, uh, like between 100 and 200 people, that's like a small village. You could spend your whole time in there and not come to the surface and you'd still have your entire day kind of filled up with meeting different people and whatever. And then outside of that, there's about, uh, what is it, like 80,000 OMIs or 80,000 unique uh, ETH addresses with some OM holdings. Um, so, you know, 200 people out of 80,000 is a small percentage. So um, uh, Olympus is community driven in the sense that for any material change to the policies or um, use of treasury funds needs to be agreed upon by the, by the majority of the DAO. Um, so I think it's at least 51% in that sense. I think it's, um, uh, it technically speaking though, um, I haven't seen a grant proposal go through with um, such low um, majority before I've not seen that happen. But yeah, so every OM holder can vote on snapshot. And if it doesn't go through, then um, for the most part, yeah, I think it, that puts a stop to it. So it's a bit unclear when you're putting up the OIP, if how, how people are going to react, like, because you don't always something that might be kind of fine from your perspective, there might be a perspective out there that finds it really, you know, a bad idea. Um, and so practically speaking, once you've put up an OIP, my personal stance is to try and get in disagreements with people, like really share my opinion on stuff and find the people who have a very different opinion to me um, and try and understand their opinion. But when I'm doing something like an OIP, kind of reach out to them and say, hey, would you mind checking out this proposal I'm going to put forward? I just want to check. I know you and me really disagree about a lot of things. Um, would it be okay if you looked this over and let me know? like what you think of it, like from your perspective, is there any problems? Um, and once you've done a few rounds of that, um, it's, if you've got like, if you found everyone who disagrees with you and run it through that and kind of taken their um, perspectives on board, by the time it gets to um, putting it in front of the community, th there's hopefully not too many surprises. Um, so I know that was a long answer. It's kind of um, there's a, a saying, I don't know where it comes from. It's probably um, from some indigenous peoples around the globe. A lot of stuff comes from folks and then gets rebranded. But if you want to, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. Um, so I think uh, one of the critiques of um, uh, orgs like uh, Olympus is that it can be a bit slow moving. Um, compared to places which call themselves a DAO, but are really just a small number of people directing things, and they can appear to be moving fast. Um, and for the most part, in some cases, many cases, they are. Um, however, like over time, I, th I think what you'll see is that um, if you want to go really far, you kind of need an organization that is moving fast relative to the number of people it has, but slow relative to super fast movers. Um, so it is a bit of a slower process compared to um, orgs where there's a real, there's a disjoint between the central org who make things happen um, and the community. And I think, I don't know the inner details. I 
think that's at the heart of some of the drama in sushi, um, from what I can tell, like a, this disconnect. Um, and it's certainly the, um, the impression that I've had from other DAOs that I've been involved in, like the less integrated the, the DAO and the, the contributors to the DAO are with the community that they're embedded within, um, the more friction and issues and ruptures um, that you'll tend towards over time. Great, great. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that segues nicely to um, uh, not so much on the sushi drama, but more on um, your own view and your own observation on on a structure in a DAO. Like, does it organically becomes a structure, or um, is it a flat structure? And and if there are any other and and Harif also has a question here. Are, are, are there any other DAOs where their own um organizing structure kind of impresses you where you see that it's working um to me you can share a little bit like if even a structure exists in a DAO, right or is it everything uh, more of like a flat uh, flat structure I think, um there's look there's this ticket on um sometimes when we're talking about DAOs or, or flat things um hierarchy is almost this dirty word that we veer away from um the structures that i've seen which um I've been most impressed by uh, um, ways which honor and actually leverage and um, utilize hierarchies, but where um, the hierarchies aren't fixed and where they um, emerge around specific contexts for specific reasons um, and where the, a hierarchy doesn't become kind of um, this like fixed thing that's immovable and unchangeable. Um, and so, the to my mind it's not so much the structure itself as the underlying culture and philosophies underpinning our choices for the ways of organizing um, in the ways that we do and so uh, i looped back to um, one of the reasons that i got involved with olympus was i picked up in a um, podcast with zeus from brad from mission DeFi, I, th I think um, I can share a link to that. Um, and when I was kind of like trying to figure out, is this thing a Ponzi? Is it real? It seems too good to be true. What's going on? The thing that one of the green flags that really um, attracted me more towards the project, there were, there, there were many. To be honest, I spent uh, three months doing a deep investigation of Olympus bef before I got involved because I was really trying to find s something wrong. Um, and actually, I started contributing because I was like, well, I can't find anything wrong from the outside. So maybe I will if I dig in from the inside. Um, and yet, I I'm now consider myself just like, I'm like so convinced. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to keep working here forever now. But um, in the podcast with Zeus, um, the thing which he said, which I found um, very appealing was the, um, the, the fact that really soon after launch, um, they committed to and actually um, delivered on um, transitioning to a DAO really quickly after launch. Um, and the fact that the early founders and the initiators of the project at every opportunity always gave a shout out to community members other people who were involved, the fact that um, products were being produced and they didn't have direct involvement or initiate it. Um, I think there's a really big ticket that where DAOs and the structures of them, you have a really hard time escaping from your foundations. So whatever gets laid down at the beginning, the early culture, the early, um, the early initiators and founders, um, kind of predetermine what a lot of the potential future structure can be. Um, if you have founders and initiators who are truly dedicated to decentralization, not just of the technologies that we use, but of power of the organizational structure, of the ability for new contributors to feel empowered to produce something, unless that exists within the um, early foundation founders, um, vision 
And unless they deliver on it, in my opinion, most um, DAOs are sitting on a ticking time bomb um, in the sense that what will happen um, for the most part is people in the space, not everyone, because some people are here to fill our bags and um, make a lot of money, no judgment. Um, but a whole bunch of other people are here because they're very dedicated to the vision of a decentralized future, permissionless, um, open access, um, transparent, fair, equitable. Um, when there's a, um, uh, a dissonance, like a, a, a strong separation between what people think they're arriving into compared to the kind of under the surface actual um, uh, established power structures that might not be clearly defined in process or marketing or what you publicly say, um, there's going to be a lot of internal conflict within the org and a lot of confusion externally within the community. And so um, the thing that impressed me about Olympus was the fact that um, there's this culture of um, building a thing and then shipping it and then telling people about it. Or if um, they talk about it, they deliver on it really quickly. So I think it was in March or April, Zeus wrote a Medium post, which I can share a link to it saying, we're initially going to launch in a bit of a centralized way. So we're going to have uh, multi-sig holders for um, policy and for the treasury. Um, and the vision is that we're going to move to on-chain governance and we'll hand over to the community. So this middle ground will be, yes, uh, we internal to the DAO and the initial um, founding team will be um, centralized to begin with, but we're at the service of the community. So they set up manual processes such as voting um, and snapshot process that uh, community needed to vote on. And now where are we? We're uh, Thursday, December 16th. Um, GOM has now been launched. So that's governance arm um, and migration is underway. So that's the space between say April, March, April, when this product project launched through to now, um, move to on-chain uh, governance. Um, that can only happen because the founders are truly dedicated to decentralization. And by being truly dedicated to it, they attract um, an entire DAO's worth of people, primarily who are also into decentralization. Um, and that's quite rare in this space. Um, I won't name names. I won't comment on ex exact other people, but you, you know who I'm talking about. You know which product um, projects where um, the, the word DAO is used or decentralized is used, but there's a dissonance between kind of people's words and their actions. Um, and in my experience, if the actions and the words um, are not in line, that's not going to change. Um, and so I think uh, the opportunity for us as DGENs, as, as um, OMIs, as mushrooms, as people involved in the um, decentralized space, that if your thing is decentralization, look for the projects who are using decentralized technologies, but also in terms of the way they're organizing. Um, because it's pretty rare, but when you find them, they're pretty special. Um, and uh, another thing that they tend to do is they'll tend to dog food. They'll like build stuff for their own purposes. So projects which tend to do that, um, especially dog fooding around internal governance and this type of thing, that they're the real deal. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, thank you, Olamai. I think that is a, a good note to end our community meetup tonight. Um, I would like to apologize for everyone because there are a lot of questions that we didn't managed to get to. Um, and uh, well, my, maybe if you don't mind, um, uh, I can share with, uh, with them your Twitter account. Uh, and, and maybe uh, any final words from you on if anyone uh, are interested to know more about um, Olympus or about DAOs in general that uh, you can guide them to? Um, yes, just, you know, hit me up on Twitter. I don't like, I might be, if there's a bunch, you know, there's quite a few people in this room. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> it might take me a little bit to respond, but I'll get back to everyone. And um, uh, maybe I can 
put up a thread afterwards with some good resources um, for DAO 101 and getting started. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit anxious that I realized I made, I was imprecise in some ways in the talk earlier about the slides. So I'm, I'm definitely gonna um, link you to Ask Fee's version. So you should consider Ask Fee's as the source of truth and mine as the like uh, chatting about DAOs. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Ulamai. Um, Harif, I pass it back the, uh, the call to you. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Asfar. And thanks a lot, Ulamai. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining. Um, this is the December uh, EFTL meetup. I'm going to hit on stop recording now.